on 0913-156-5016 or 0812-794-9323 or visit our social media pages. Cast Prints, digital printing at super speed. infrastructure, standard facilities, and beautiful amenities. Our estates at Adam Homes come affordable with great discounts and flexible payment plans. No stress, no hassles. Beat your fears and take that bold step today. Subscribe to own your property. Adam Homes. Building cities, communities, and homes. Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, I, Mwawodo. Hello and welcome. Tonight, President Bola Tinubu says killers of army personnel in Ugeli South local government area of Delta State will not go unpunished as he grants defense headquarters full authority to bring the perpetrators to justice. Anambra State Governor Chuku Masaludo says he has not received any salary since assuming office as part of cost-cutting measures as he presents his midterm scorecard. Independent National Electoral Commission, INEX, set to deploy artificial intelligence for the conduct of governorship election in Edo and Undo elections. This was revealed at the Yaga Conference on Artificial Intelligence and Elections in Africa. And Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reaffirms his determination to launch an offensive in Rafah, defying international criticism on Israel-Gaza war rages. We begin with our developing story in Okwama community in Ugeli South local government area of Delta State, where 16 soldiers were killed on Thursday, March the 14th, 2024. Well, these are images of a community on fire in the early hours of today. There are strong allegations that the act may have been perpetrated by some angry soldiers over the killing of their colleagues. The military has already made some arrests led by the general officer commanding 6th Division of the Nigerian Army, Major General Jaman Abdul Surlam, while a manhunt for the killers are still on. Well, reports also indicate that residents of the coastal community have fled to neighboring Ugeli for fear of a reprisal by the soldiers who have been patrolling the creeks. Here's what we know so far. 15 bodies of the military personnel killed in Okwama community have now been recovered by soldiers of the Joint Task Force. And some of the recovered bodies were said to have been beheaded, while some vital parts of others were ripped off. Meanwhile, the military personnel, we understand, were on a peace mission to Okwama community in a Bomadi local government area of Delta State when they were attacked after they responded to a distress call following the communal crisis between Okwama and Okoloba communities, both in Delta State. A reinforcement team led by the commanding officer was also attacked, leading to the death of the commanding officer, two majors, one captain, and 12 soldiers. We also told you that the bodies of the commanding officer and the two majors were seen floating by the riverbank at the NDDC jetty in the coastal Delta community as others were separated 
on land. While following the killing, the Chief of Defence Staff, General Christopher Musa, has directed the immediate investigation and arrest of those involved in this brutal killing. Meanwhile, President Bola Tinubu says that those responsible for the killing of the 16 soldiers who were on a rescue mission in Okwama community in Ogeli South local government area of Delta State on Saturday will not go unpunished. The president's message is contained in a statement personally signed by him where he extends his profound condolences to the families of the fallen soldiers, their colleagues and their loved ones. According to the president, the incident once again demonstrates the dangers faced by servicemen and women in the line of duty. The statement reads in part, Members of our armed forces are on at heart and the core of our nationhood. Any attack on them is a direct attack on our nation. We will not accept this wicked act. The Defence Headquarters and Chief of Defence Staff have been granted full authority to bring to justice anybody found to have been responsible for this crime against the Nigerian people. The President says his government will not relent until peace and tranquility is achieved in every part of Nigeria. And still on security, but this time in Katsina State, where the Ministry of Internal Security says the civilian JTF in the state has neutralized a renowned bandit leader, Kachala Maude. According to the chairman of Batsari local government area, the civilian JTF, under the support of security agents, staged an ambush on the terrorist group led by Kachala on at Garin Rinji, which is a village in the western part of Batsari local government area. During gunshots, the JTF raided a heavy fire, rained heavy fire on the terrorists, leading to the capture of the gang leader Kachala Maude. A statement issued today by the State's Commissioner for Information and Culture, Dr. Bala, also noted that Maude and his group have been terrorizing western part of Batsari local government area. And according to that statement, Maude, before being neutralized, confessed to have led attacks in several communities along Batsari and Demusa Axis that led to the death of hundreds of innocent people. In a related development, the Community Watch Corps, which is local vigilantes group recruited by Katsina State Government, have killed more than 200 bandits in attacks over the past two weeks. They have also rescued dozens of people whom the bandits had held in captivity. Well, it appears there is no reprieve yet for the residents of Kajuru, local government area of Kaduna State, as no fewer than 14 people have now been reportedly kidnapped by suspected bandits in Dogon Noma, Ongwan Gamo community in the area. The incident comes barely one week after six people were kidnapped at Buda community, also in Kajuru, local government area. Police authorities have not yet confirmed this attack, but the local youth leader, Sani Musa, told Channels Television that the bandits in large numbers had in the early hours of Saturday morning invaded the Dog and Noma community and started shooting sporadically, during which they abducted 14 people while one person sustained injury. According to the youth leader, the only injured person, Jibrin Dauda, has now been taken to hospital for medical attention. The Rebuild Arewa Initiative for Development, known as RAID, a northern socio-political group, has condemned the Senate's decision to suspend Senator Abdul Ningi for three months for expressing concern over irregularities in the 2024 national budget. Addressing a news conference in Abuja, the president of the group, Balarabi Rufai, says the suspension of Senator Abdul Ningi from the National Assembly is a matter of great concern and injustice to his constituents at a vocal senator. The group insists that Senator Ningi should be reinstated unconditionally as his suspension amounts to a civilian coup which robs the people of Bochi State of quality representation at the Senate. Senator Ningi, as the chairman of the Northern Senators and a pivotal figure within the PDP, has been at the forefront of crusades for openness and oversight. Now, he faces an imposing obstacle, one ostensibly aimed at dissuading his, and by extension, our pursuit of equity. The ripple of support for Abdul Ningi 
from Nigerians, especially those hailing from the north, has taken shape as an unyielding wave of unity. We stand firm in our call for his swift and unconditional reinstatement by marginalizing one of our most articulate and staunch advocates. The assembly has inflicted a blow not only on an individual senator, but also shaking the democratic bedrock upon which our society stands. In the face of recent revelations around about 3.7 trillion Naira in Nigeria's 2024 budget, the public budgeting expert and research fellow, Dr. Emeka Ejinkonye, says that until the elected officials understand the power they have to curb the activities of the civil service, there will be no end in budget padding in Nigeria's system. He made this assertion in an exclusive interview with Channels Television. Mr. Ejinkonye is recommending that the budget office be situated in the office of the president and reporting directly to the president the budget office of the united the executive budgeting office of the united states is located inside the white house it is the instrument with which the president of america coordinates the activities of the whole administration the formal organization there with permanent staff what the president does when he has is he appoints the head when he leaves, he takes the head away. That agency remains. Are you getting what I'm saying? When I say an institutional coordinator agency is a permanent agency with permanent pensionable staff working on behalf for the president to carry out the purpose of the president, let's reform budgeting, please, because it is from budgeting you know, that, that will start solving the problem of security. You see, the, for me, the primary, the priority of Nigeria today is to solve the problem of hunger. But there is no way you can solve the problem of hunger if um, forests are, are not safe for farmers to go into. As long as we continue to put this money, at the, particularly in the Ministry of Defense, at the level of the Minister and the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Defense, we can never achieve our purpose. We must get down to the big guys in the field. For the full interview with Dr. Ejin Konye, please watch Newsnight on Channels Television on Monday, March the 18th at 9 p.m. Anambra State Governor Professor Chikuma Saludo says he has not received any salary since he assumed office two years ago. The governor disclosed this during a Thanksgiving mass and presentation of his call card in the state capital, Oka, earlier today. <laughs> The International Convention Center, Oka, comes alive as the government and people of Anambra State gather at the instance of the governor for a midterm performance update. The Lord be with you. Thanksgiving Mass begins the event as officiated by the Catholic Bishop of Newi, Most Reverend Jonah Spenson Okoye. The homily by the Bishop of Oka Diocese, Most Reverend Paulinus Eze Okafo, touches on the exemplary leadership of Governor Soludo, noting that two years on, the present administration has done well in critical areas of security, education, agriculture, youth empowerment, and infrastructural development. A commendation speech from the former Secretary General of Commonwealth, Chief Emeka Anyoku, kickstarts the second segment of the celebration. He came to office with three attributes that have proved to be his enablers. The first attribute is his sound, very sound intellectual capacity. And the second attribute is that Professor Chukuma Saludo is a man of the character of can do. Third attribute 
is his quite uncommon combination of ability to live in the ivory tower combined with the ability to belong to the streets where the masses of our people live and work. In a well-articulated speech lasting over an hour, Governor Soludo presents his midterm scorecard tagged Foundational Footprints. As I speak to you, I have not, I'm not being, I'm, I'm not taking any salary, I'm not paid any salary by Anambra State Government. Even the First Lady of Anambra doesn't have any official car. She still drives my personal vehicles. We are executing the most austere government ever and directing resources, cutting waste, cutting the court of governance to bare bones and directing resources, prioritizing them to what is the most important for the people. The governor, predicating his achievements on the five major pillars of his administration that include security, law and order, infrastructure and economic transformation and environment, among others, says the People's Manifesto and the Vision 2070 documents will be the compass. At over 240 kilometers of road asphalted in 24 months, that comes to execution capacity of over 10 kilometers every month every month that will have been in office. I can remember what We're not talking about the flyovers or the bridges and so on and so forth. Our target is to be distributing a minimum of one million seedlings every year. We are now started the procurement for this year's own. The event climax with the governor acknowledging that he is executing the most austere government ever and he is only channeling resources where necessary. He discloses that in the coming days, his administration will change gear to accelerate on critical areas that need government intervention. In part two after the break, Duchess International Hospital achieves another feat after successfully performing open heart surgeries on a five-month-old baby and a 12-year-old girl. Please join us again. Man, the rain is so heavy here. And there's so much traffic. I think we should go school, huh? Not a chance. Aye, sir. We don't quit, guys. I'll be there. Done. <sighs> Two files received. I'm on my way. Take the first right in 50 meters and you're there. Copy that. Aye, sir. Where are you? Guess where? Two minutes. Two minutes. Move. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Runway X. The future of fashion showcases. Very impressive. How did you pull that off? With Nigeria's top tech talents. And glow. Power your relentless ambition with ultra high speed data. Know that you can now print all your essential items for events without even having to leave your home? It's the Cast Prints Combo Deal for all events. Yes! Weddings, conferences, birthdays, burials, etc. Starting from 495,000 Naira only. You get 50 invites, 50 A2 size posters, 50 16 page brochures, one large backdrop banner, one roll up banner, 50 jotters with pens, and 50 souvenir carrier bags. Whatever event you're planning, we can adjust to your budget and quantities. Just send your pictures and other information through WhatsApp and we shall send a design for your approval. Approve your design and we will produce with super high quality digital print technology. We can even arrange delivery to your location. Call us now on 0913-156-5016 or 0812-794-9323 or visit our social media pages. Cast Prints, digital printing at super speed.
Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our main stories. President Bola Tinubu says killers of army personnel in Ugeli South local government area of Delta State will not go unpunished as he grants defense headquarters full authority to bring the perpetrators to justice. Anambra State Governor Chuku Masaludo says he has not received any salary since assuming office as part of cut-cutting cost measures as he presents his midterm scorecard. Independent National Electoral Commission, INEX, set to deploy artificial intelligence for the conduct of governorship election in Edo and Undo. This was revealed at the Yaga Conference on Artificial Intelligence and Elections in Africa. And Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reaffirms his determination to launch an offensive in Rafah, defying international criticism as Israel-Gaza war rages on. One in 1,000 children are born with some sort of congenital heart disease. And that's according to consultant, cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Michael Sanusi. He was speaking at an event organized by Duchess International Hospital to celebrate the success of two pediatric heart surgeries. He stresses, however, that the earlier of such a condition is detected and treated, the better the outcome for the child. Here at the Duchess International Hospital, a common assertion is that care is not just about treatment or a surgery, but how the patient fares after a procedure. Two patients who have been in the hospital's lens are teenager Precious, whom her carers describe as quick to learn and fun, and little baby M, both brought in with heart conditions. A team of cardiothoracic surgeons here successfully repaired um, Precious's aneurysm, a complete um, revision and replacement of what we call the aortic root, and she's done extremely well. Small baby with a hole in the heart, a ventricular septal defect um, with pulmonary hypertension, meaning with hypertension in the lungs, which is one of the um, things that can complicate a ventricular septal defect. Many parents might wonder what symptoms would warrant a need for open heart surgery. They don't, they're using all their energy to breathe and to manage the heart failure so they, they don't feed well, they fall asleep while feeding, they breathe fast, and um, they're very irritable, they don't gain weight. A team of specialists conducted Precious's open heart surgery in November 2023, while baby M received his in February this year. Precious's and baby M's parents are delighted at the results of the surgery and grateful for all the support they received from the time it was clear that their children needed to go under the knife. Let me still use this opportunity to thank our sponsor because the moment he heard about it, Alaji Sulaiman Adebola Adegua, the, as our father, the chairman of Right Foods Limited, he came through for us. He said, okay, he recommended Duchess. He said, the best place as far as is concerned to take this baby for a compounded uh, surgery like this is so duchess so and he footed the bill and he was responsible for the whole process she was this almost getting things almost all the time she can't walk a distance she can't walk very fast she can't do much work and uh, that was the day i came back home and she was almost gone so today, she can do virtually everything. The, the extent of happiness I have, that a body is taking off you, this was a girl that was almost gone. According to her father, it's a new lease of life for Precious, and the doctors say both she and baby M can have a normal childhood with minimal supervision and grow up as healthy adults. What goes up must come down, the law of gravity. Millions of Nigerians are hoping that the law of gravity will soon apply to the rising inflation rate. Meanwhile, the National Bureau of Statistics, the MBS, has released the latest report on inflation, 31.7% per annum. And tonight, our focus is on what do the latest inflation numbers mean for citizens and business owners. Babajide Ogunsao, founder of Leadership by Data and Channels Television's data analyst, is here to share insights on this. Hello, Abajide. Thank you for joining us on the News at 10 tonight. Hello, hello. 
The Bureau pleasure is all mine. The pleasure right. is always mine. The Bureau of Statistics inflation report shows that the prices of goods across Nigeria have risen by 31.7%. Now, relative to what it was when we talk about a year ago, how significant is this? It is significant. Um, I would like to explain the significance in three points. Three cosmic points of very urgent um, areas that we should talk about. The first is... Approximately a third of a century ago, um, on this day in 1992, apartheid ended in South Africa. Um, what is probably most likely known as racial segregation came to an end on this day in South Africa in 1992. Now, why do I refer, refer to racial segregation? In Nigeria, inflation is actually apartheid in disguise, and I'll explain. Inflation at 31.7% is the equivalent of income segregation, just as South Africa had racial segregation. So right now, what is going on in Nigeria is income segregation, appetite in disguise. That is the first of three points which we need to have in our minds. The second point, Anne, is that the last time inflation was as high as 31.7% in Nigeria, was back in April 1996. But April, Nigeria of April 1996 is different from today's Nigeria. In April 1996, when we had inflation this high, the country then only had 112 million mouths. Now, between April 1996 to date, we've had a, the population growing by 100 million people. In simple terms, and we have a population today where approximately half of them have never lived in a country where inflation has surpassed 30%. And so we're going to likely see a lot of rational and, yes, irrational behavior. It will be extremely hard for economists to model what the future of Nigeria currently will be because, like I said, half of those that are living in Nigeria currently I've never experienced a Nigeria where inflation has been this high. So we'll likely see a lot of irrational consumer behavior. Well, the, the third and perhaps okay. one of the most important points is that if we look back to April 2019, exactly April the 18th, it was a Thursday, April 18, 2019, was an extremely good day for Nigerian workers. That was the day President Buhari signed the minimum wage bill. April 18, 2019. If you carefully study the inflation report between April 2019 to date, inflation has crossed 140%. In simple terms, there is no more such a thing called minimum wage. Once inflation crosses the 100% mark, then workers no longer have a minimum wage. And from April 18, 2019, when the Minimum Wage Act bill was signed, till today, inflation, combined inflation, cumulative inflation, 140%. What I'm saying, Anne, is for that worker that is still earning a minimum wage, is technically working for free, not, is not working for a minimum wage, if you look at it relative to 2019. So those are the core three points. Well, Anne, beyond these three points, what the inflation report also allows us to see now is that, yes, it's an inflation rate report, but it is also standing as a barometer to measure anger. So I'd like us to take a look at the food inflation, especially looking at it from the geopolitical zones. What exactly is the state of inflation across the three, six geopolitical zones relative to what it was last year? Because it then will allow us to see which regions perhaps which regions are families really getting angry? Looking at the data and the food basket from the National Bureau of Statistics, they say that if we analyze the numbers, the South-South region, 40.7% annual food inflation. In terms of price change between what it was this time last year, Southeast, 40.4%, the Southwest, 40%, and across the north, we see a slightly sub 40% inflation rate. 
In summary, inflation, especially food inflation, is biting families living in southern Nigeria significantly more than it's biting families living in northern Nigeria. But, Babaji, I mean, economists have already given different reasons about the cause of Nigeria's inflation situation. Is there anything that stands out for you? There are several things that economists are getting right and are getting wrong. Yes, um, the fuel price, the fuel price, the exchange rates, the population growth rate. But because of time, there's one that I want us to quickly focus on. And if you can pull that up, let's look at Nigeria's money supply over the last five years, because it then allows us to see the role money supply is playing in how prices have changed. Let's focus on January 2019 to 2020. You see, as of January 2019, money supply, 33 trillion naira. It grew by 1% in 2020 to, to, by 1 in 2020 to 34 trillion naira. January 2021, 38 trillion. January 2022, 45 trillion. January 2023, 53 trillion. In all these years, what you see is that the annual growth of money supply has been below 20% year on year. But let's focus on what has happened between January 2023 to January 2024. Money supply has grown from 53 trillion naira to 93 trillion naira, a growth of 76%. That is one major reason why we are where we are today. There is so much money chasing very few goods. Again, I repeat, never in our recent history have we seen money supply grow by as much as 76%. Prior to now, looking at all the previous five years and looking at it accurately from January of each year, we've seen that the growth in money supply has been sub-20%. However, in the last 12 months, money supply has significantly Grown. All right, and but that is one of the reasons limited... why inflation currently is at a 28-year high. All right, but Vajide, just in 30 seconds, please. How much is insecurity affecting the ease of doing business and in farming, and how is it affecting food supply in the country? With insecurity and food, quickly, there's some good news and, and bad news. Despite the challenges that we are seeing that the armed forces are having, in Delta states, we see them take a position on what they will do to manage the food situation. If you can quickly take bring, we can quickly take a look at some of the statements made by the the military with regards to how important food is and their role on managing this. We clearly see that they've clearly taken the position that hunger clearly is as dangerous. Perhaps even the most dangerous nuclear weapon. That is a statement. Hunger is the most dangerous of all nuclear weapons. And the leaders of the armed forces are saying they are doing all they can to make sure that farmers produce what they need to produce. So that's coming, and that's some good news. However, Anne, the bad news is that if we take a look at Nigeria's population and agricultural production figures, it allows you to see that the challenges we face go beyond insecurity. What, what I mean is that in 1990, our population was 100 million people. 100 million. I, you might just want to write that down. 1990, 100. As of 2020, it was 200 million. And so what we've seen is that in 30 years, we've had an additional 100 million um, mouths to feed. The question is, has agricultural productivity per hectare improved? Okay. And I've gone to the national libraries and I've studied a lot of agricultural research. And the summary is, Nigeria's population is growing exponentially, uh -oh, yet uh -oh, our agricultural productivity per hectare isn't significantly improving. Okay, let's and so in simple terms, even if the nation were as calm as the skies, mm. as long as agricultural productivity does not improve, and it hasn't been improving even before insecurity, 1990 to 2000, agricultural productivity per hectare wasn't improving. So we need to realize that insecurity is 
only the fall guy. All right, thank you very much. Our problems go beyond insecurity. Thanks a lot. That's a good place to end. Babajide Ogunso, founder of Leadership by Data and Channels Television's data analyst from our studios in Abuja. Thanks a lot for your time on the news at 10. Still ahead on the news at 10. Can AI be used to enhance election management? That is one of the areas of focus of an ongoing conference on artificial intelligence and elections in Africa. Well, our correspondent, Kayode Okikiolu, brings us the highlights after this break. Let's stay with us. We live in an era of massive innovation true ideas that impact every industry and society. Cutting-edge technology that gives you a glimpse of the future. Intuitive minds that meet the demand of a revolution of talent. The future of enterprise lies in the digital world. It's full of questions and yet solutions. Join us on Tech Trends as we bring you the finest blend of technology and the latest happenings in the tech space. Tech Trends, the tech edge you need. Welcome back. Contractors handling all federal road projects in Kogi State have been warned against compromising quality and to ensure timely completion of their projects. The Minister of Works, Mr. David Omahe, gave this warning while inspecting some of the federal road projects under construction and rehabilitation in the state. The Minister of Works, Mr. Dave Omahe, is on an inspection visit to local jail to Kogi State Capital. <laughs> He's accompanied by officials from the state, including the Deputy Governor, Mr. Salifu Oyibo. They make their first stop at the ongoing reconstruction of the local Jaganaja Road, which failed due to the impact of flooding in the area. Mr. Umahi charges the contractors to ensure prompt completion of the road. Next is the local Jalkene Auchi Benin Highway, which will now have a flyover bridge around the Obajana Junction in Lokoja to ease the gridlock that always occurs, especially during Yuletide season. We're trying to also bring uh, our concrete, uh, reinforced concrete uh, road technology to see that, um, you know, let the public see that the moment you use this concrete technology for the next 50, 60, 70, 80 years, your road will continue to be like that with zero maintenance. And um, that's what we've agreed with contractors, especially on the new um, uh, uh, carriageway for uh, Lokoja to Benin. The inspection tour winds up at the ongoing road rehabilitation in Koto Karfi, where the Minister of Works says President Bola Tinubu has assured the timely completion of all ongoing federal road projects in Kogi State. The team also inspected the Filele and Akpaya sections of the local Jai Abuja Highway. Work on seven critical points on the road will soon be ramped up by the federal government. We have over seven different uh, projects, two old ones, and we have about five we are starting new, one on concrete road, and um, within the next one, two weeks, the project will be started. Those that are applying this road on a regular basis, they are happy because their dream is coming true, becoming a reality, that this road is going to be a very good road for them to apply. The inspection tour winds up at the ongoing road rehabilitation in Koto Karfi, where the Minister of Works says President Bola Tinubu has assured the timely completion of all ongoing federal road projects in Kogi State. <laughs> See 
The Lagos state government has commenced the operation of Sunday food markets across the state. Channels Television was out to monitor the exercise in some areas in the state, and the deputy majority leader of the state house of assembly, Mr. Adeda Mola Kasumu, who was also out on the field, says that this is one of the initiatives rolled out by the state government to support the people at this difficult time, and more support of the scheme will also be introduced by the state house of assembly. He appealed to the people to be patient with the state officials, as well as the vendors on ground for seamless exercise. We're going to be opening, you know, um, what we call Sunday markets in about 42 markets in Lagos. Sunday market. What you will see in, that, in, in those markets, you know, is the same sort of like, you know, stable, you know, food item. But this time, you'll be buying, but you'll be buying at a reduced cost. Three weeks after the pronouncement was made by Governor Babajide Somolu, the Lagos Sunday market called Onjeko is now open for residents across the five divisions of the state to reduce the economic hardship being experienced by the people. Koramu Junior College, Victoria Island, is the first Sunday market visited. Not so many people are available due to a mix-up of the address. Even the vendor, they miss their way. Why the delay is because the vendor did not do the package accordingly. They were doing it here. One of the makeshift markets in the Keja area is Tokumbo Ali Primary School. Some residents arrived before the 11 a.m. scheduled time to make their purchase, and this is what they have to say. Everything is working in a way that not suits everybody. I believe by next time they will organize themselves well. Good initiative, good work. Reward for good work is more work. <laughs> so it can't be 100% like perfect, but it's, it's a good way to start. The lead team of Ikeja Market explains the process of buying and selling at the vendor point. What you need to do is take your ATM card to the service provider, they will issue you a voucher. So based on the item you want to buy, you pick up the voucher, take it to the vendor, then collect your items. But you cannot buy uh, uh, two items at a time. So if you are giving them a voucher, that voucher must carry the food items you want to buy. But you can buy more than one food items, but not buying the same two items with one voucher. And the voucher you are carrying only works for this Sunday. At Agege area of Dairy Farm Secondary School, residents make their way to purchase food items, but egg and bread are the first two items being sold to the people as of the time of this visit. The people of Ujudu are eager to make their payment and pick up their items. Some of them commence government efforts for the 25% discount. I think it's a very good initiative. You know, it's, we want more of this from the Lagos State Government. But Deputy Majority Leader of the State is, House of Assembly, Honorable Adida Mola Kasumu, and a, and a member of the State Special Dispensation Palliative Advisory Committee, Joe Oke Odumake, speak on the additional palliative from the Assembly with an assurance of better performance from next week. I, as representative of the people, uh, also committing to uh, getting at least food vouchers uh, that would um, that would cost up to about a thousand naira food vouchers that will cut across 1,000 constituents at least, you know, to start with, to be able to further support the 25% discount that has already been given by the state government. What can be done is to increase the sales points so that we have more people and then more residents can be attended to. This is the pilot phase of the Lagos Sunday market expected to last for a period of three months. And the state government is appealing to residents to visit any of the 57 locations in order to benefit from the Food Palliative Initiative. The National 
Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, says that it is already deploying artificial intelligence for the conduct of coming elections in Edo and Undo states, especially for result management to ensure that only authentic results are uploaded. And that's coming from INEC's acting director of ICT, Mr. Lawrence Biodi, who was speaking on the sidelines of the Artificial Intelligence and Elections in Africa conference in Nairobi, Kenya. Nigeria is one of five African countries set to be deploying AI in its elections and the natural question is will AI enhance our elections or not? Our correspondent Kaya Diokikiolu is in Nairobi and reports. 2024 has been described as the biggest election year in history with about 50 elections to take place the world over and Africa accounts for just about half of that. But then there's a dark horse that may impact the outcome of that election either for good or for bad. I'm talking about artificial intelligence with deep fakes, disinformation on the rise, and of course, the potential for good. The question is, what will the artificial intelligence do to our elections? I am in Nairobi, Kenya, the venue of this conference on artificial intelligence and elections in Africa, organized by Yaga Africa and its partners. Processes. Represented in this hall are 22 African countries and election management bodies, as well as big tech companies, election observers and leaders. The goal is to reflect on the opportunities and risks of AI integration in critical aspects of election administration. First is a background on what artificial intelligence is and the potentials. We know that it enhances processes and improves outcomes, but... <laughs> Technology and AI in particular, um, as we're seeing it, can also cause um, harms. Um, we know that it can, and sometimes we, we're seeing that it can exacerbate existing challenges. What do we mean by AI? You know, artificial intelligence is an umbrella term for computer systems that use data algorithms and computing power to perform a range of tasks that historically human intelligence um, was needed for, right? You can think about this as things like recognizing images, recognizing patterns, extrapolating patterns and features from data, um, and then also making predictions or even generating data. And then a picture of the optic of AI in elections on the continent so far. They employ AI um, for, for elections, and these countries are South Africa, Nigeria, Eswatini, Madagascar, and Cameroon. The other 19 countries um, said, they're not deploying AI yet. Some say they will never. Some say they will. And they give reasons why they will deploy AI. So this is based on, you know, the 23 countries. The conference gets into plenaries with key stakeholders providing insight into the burning questions. The colleague of mine was asking this uh, programming language they call Python. Is it the snake? And, and, all that. and, and he's... <laughs> He's also expected to make a decision on uh, whether we should use Python or to use something. For Nigeria's INEC, AI is already being incorporated into the coming governorship elections in Edo and Ondo. One area where we are currently deploying AI is that area um, of our resort management system. Um, that's the area where um, we need to upload the resort sheet onto the RF portal. Um, that system um, uses AI to ensure that only INEC result is uploaded onto the um, IREF. Adopting AI in the electoral process can address the challenge of human interference and inefficiency. On the flip side, however, actors could use generative AI to impersonate election officials or clone results. AI-based authentication of biometrics could produce errors, or worse still, Algorithms could be used to target specific voters. And naturally, the question of trust still hangs in the air. So citizens need to start asking questions. If INEC is going to be deploying technology, what is the technology? Who are we buying this technology from? How much are we buying this technology? Is INEC conducting audits? Are the audit processes open and transparent for political parties, for um, civil society, for media to be part of it? Because as we've seen in other African countries, EMBs engage critical stakeholders to participate in audit processes. And the third and perhaps the last point is that whilst technology is a powerful tool for protecting electoral integrity, 
it could be a tool for undermining electoral integrity. And so it is not perfect, but to a large extent, it can help curb some of the excesses. And we have to believe in technology, but do so cautiously. Just in case you're wondering what AI can do, here's a sample. De cet événement, de nombreuses questions ont été répondues, mais il reste encore plus de questions sans réponse. Now, that wasn't me speaking French. That was AI. From this serene neighborhood in Nairobi, Kenya, Kayode Okikulu reporting for Channels Television News. And now to the arts. Women are celebrated at the AO Gallery in Lagos with a group art exhibition. We see the works of art that honor the remarkable moments in the lives of women on Art Review tonight. <laughs> Inspired Eves is an art exhibition celebrating women on International Women's Day at the AO Gallery in Lagos. The theme of the exhibition, as you know, is uh, uh, Inspired Eve. And the theme of this year is uh, inclusion, you know, meaning inclusiveness of women in all areas of uh, human endeavor, especially economic en endeavor, and meaning women should be part of the policy making, because the areas that affect them, they are the only ones who can tell you about it. Without inclusiveness, we are not going to get the 100% solution to our problems if you don't take their own views into uh, reckoning. Over 20 paintings and sculptural pieces salute women in different areas as seen in pieces like Elegance, Milkmaid, Market Woman, created by male and female artists. The work today was really to say to women, you don't have to be perfect. Everything doesn't have to be in place before you move. If you are 50% sure of what you're doing, start. You'll make the mistakes, don't be afraid. Just keep moving, correcting those mistakes and keep moving. And you'll find that you will achieve a lot. Those are two of my works and I titled this um, Whispers from the Soul. Okay, so basically women, we go through so many ordeals. We have so many responsibilities beyond even what we can, ourselves can imagine. Okay, so we have a lot of um, things going on in our minds. So we get to whisper them, even though we mask ourselves in so many other things. So basically, you see a beautiful lady, but there's so many things going on in the mind. So I titled this particular work, Whispers from the Soul. And the other one over there is titled The Promise. Okay, so in life, um, at one point or the other, you've been promised one thing or the other. And in the place of women, okay, it's either your love and family life, love life, you've been promised one or two things. As a mother, automatically nature promises you that your child will take care of you at old age. But the question is, with all those promises, how many of them come to fulfillment? But the beauty of it is that women, either these uh, promises come to pass or not, we, we are still strong, we still hold on to them, and we believe that it will see us through at the end of the day. And that is why we are very strong. The show, which is a collaboration between the AO Cultural Renaissance Center and the UK Department of Business and Trade, features works of art that align with this year's theme, Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. <laughs> Rivers United beat Hartland of Owere by a lone goal in match day 26 of the Nigeria Premier League played this evening at the Adokia Masimaka Stadium in Port Harcourt River State. Okemel Williams got the only goal for the pride of Rivers. Bielsa United beat former champions Canopillas 2-1 in Yenogwa, while Bendel Insurance beat Doma United 4-0 at the Samuel Obamudia Stadium in Benin City. While for Rangers International, they beat league leaders Lobby Stars 2-1, while reigning champions Enyimba International moved third on the log following a 3-1 win against Niger Tornadoes. Katsina United and Sporting Lagos all recorded vital home wins in today's games. 
Manchester United have ended Liverpool's quest for a quadruple of trophies as Jürgen Klopp's final season after Amadiallo's winner edged a thrilling English FA Cup quarterfinal 4-3 after extra time. Twice, United had to come from behind as a rare goal from Anthony levelled a 2-2 to send the game into an extra half an hour before Marcus Rashford and Diallo turned the tie around in the final 10 minutes of extra time. And earlier, late goals from players of Nigerian descent, Canary Chukwe Mika and Noni Madueke helped Chelsea to a 4-2 victory against Leicester, booking their sport in the English FA Cup semi-finals. The win now maintains Chelsea's hopes of ending a very difficult season on a high by winning the FA Cup for the first time since 2018. Meanwhile, in the semi-final draw conductor this evening, defending champions Manchester City will face Chelsea at Wembley, while Manchester United's reward for their thrilling win against Liverpool is a meeting with second-tier Coventry. But today's draw for the last four raised the prospect of a repeat of last season's All-Manchester FA Cup final, which City won at 2-1. Ties to be played at Wembley on the weekend of April the 20th through to the 21st. Florian Wirt scored after 84 seconds as Bayern Leverkusen made it 38 games unbeaten in all their competitions with a 3-2 victory earlier today. Leverkusen's seventh league win on the bounce kept them 10 points clear of serial champions Bayern Munich with eight games to play in their quest for the club's first ever Bundesliga crown. Bayern also closed the gap to seven points after beating rock bottom Demonstered at 5-2 on Saturday, but Leverkusen showed no sign of pressure as they restored their healthy advantage. Away from football, let's talk NBA. Stephen Curry returned from a sprained ankle to score 31 points to spark the Golden State Warriors to a 1-2-8, 1-2-1 win over the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers squandered a 40-point performance by LeBron James in failing, falling to the Warriors. But Curry also missed Warriors past three games. He added six rebounds and five assists while hitting 12 of 24 shots from the floor and three of 10 from three-point range. Nigeria's legislators are looking forward to a closer and more understandable partnership with civil society organizations and understanding the sustaining collaboration with the civil society groups. This was put together by the EU agents for citizen-driven transformation program through the British Council and held in Lagos, Nigeria over the weekend. The chairman, Senate Committee on Diaspora and NGO, Senator Victor Omer, says the arrangements have already been concluded to reopen the civil society organization's liaison office at the National Assembly Complex to implement discussions. Our correspondent, Amarachi Bani reports. National Assembly members, led by the chairman, Senate Committee on Diaspora and NGO, Senator Victor Omer, take time from their busy schedules to give priority to a workshop organized by the European Union through the British Council in Lagos. Um, what, you mean you, uh, what, is, what is it, five or six extra minutes? For two days, they rob minds with representatives of civil society organizations on needs and wants with the common goal of creating a more conducive democratic society in Nigeria. So as regards the collaboration with the CSOs, we've done very well. Welcoming participants to the workshop, country director, British Council, Lucy Pearson, said as a council marks its 80th anniversary in Nigeria, it is proud to partner with the EU to help facilitate the workshop in helping to strengthen the partnership of legislators and CSOs. Also, National Program Manager of EU ACT, Mr. Damilari Babalola, emphasized the need for CSOs to be more credible. This two-day workshop provides a unique opportunity for us to explore ways to strengthen the partnership between legislators and civil society organizations, which will create an enabling environment where civil society thrives, legislative processes are enhanced, and the voices of all citizens are heard and valued. We think that if civil rights organizations are well capacitated, uh, they are doing very well in what they know, uh, what they know, you know, uh, uh, doing. Um, but they are weak 
regulatory environment, they won't be able to thrive in. Acknowledging the importance of civil societies in holding power accountable, the chairman of its committee on diaspora and NGOs, Senator Victor Omer, harps on the values CSOs bring to any government. The civil society is actually are the catalysts for driving the necessary changes in any society. When we have a vibrant um, civil society, the, the country will be on its toes. Uh, everybody will be on guard to ensure that the right things are done at the right time and at all times. He later revealed the Senate's plan to reopen a CSO liaison office in the National Assembly. We are reopening the civil society organization's liaison office in the National Assembly. That office will become a processing center for all the things that we need to be doing in Nigeria. At the end of the workshop, participants, both legislators and CSOs, look forward to better collaborations in the near future. Amarachi Ubani, Channel Television News. Russian President Vladimir Putin has won the country's presidential election with 87.97% of the vote. The voting took place against the backdrop of one of the harshest crackdowns on the opposition and the freedom of speech in the country. It's been three days of voting for Russians around the world in the country's presidential elections in which Vladimir Putin the country's president is guaranteed to win a fifth time after a culmination of 19 years under his belt. It's an election condemned by the White House as obviously not free nor fair. Even Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has condemned the polls saying the Russian president wants to rule forever and that the presidential election was an illegitimate imitation. But Vladimir Putin is not the only name on the ballot. Three other names offered voters varying choices. Ultra-nationalist Leonid Slotsky of the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, Vladislav Davenkov of the relatively liberal New People's Party, and veteran candidate Nikolai Karantinov of the Communist Party are supporting characters of the political geography. Although there were a few skirmishes as police clashed with protesters, the polls have gone largely peacefully. And by Sunday evening, after polls closed, the first official results showed Vladimir Putin had won 87.97 of the presidential vote. The early results followed an exit poll that showed Putin winning 87.8% of the vote. And the main news again. Parts of the Okwama community in Ugeli South local government area of Delta State, where 16 soldiers were killed, have been raised by unknown persons. We also reported that Duchess International Hospital has achieved another feat after successfully performing open heart surgeries on a five-month-old baby and a 12-year-old girl. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu. Good night.